I, I might uh, add to uh, the last uh, speaker's comments that we may be, it may be premature to be seeking regulations. Uh, for a half century, we've had guidelines that most people follow and uh, has been fairly successful. And I might say that the FDA has lamp safety standards that relate to UV, uh, high pressure lamps and uh, sun lamps because there've been real, uh, uh, quite significant injuries. Whereas they don't have one for germicidal UV. They don't see uh, until today anyway, a public health issue uh, to worry about. So uh, Paul pointed this out, but I like to emphasize the distinction between two categories of standards and regulations. One has to do with the emission of a product, and that's a product safety standard like UL 8802 that uh, was just mentioned. And then the other have to do with exposure limits. And most exposure limits, uh, relate to occupational health and safety in this area. Uh, they, they can't very reg well regulate sunlight. Uh, and so the result is uh, you will exceed the occupational exposure limits in about five or 10 minutes uh, in the summertime, uh, which should tell you that the exposure limits are quite conservative. So. When we're talking about product safety standard, they are regulating emission. They are, and all the measurements are focused on emission. And then the question is, where did these limits come from? Well, the product safety emission limits are based upon the exposure limits. And in the absence of general public exposure limits, the uh, early standards had to rely on the uh, existing occupational exp exposure limits. And the first were published just a half century ago, uh, about 1972-73. So they go back a long time and they have not changed in the far UVC for almost 50 years. And then uh, last year they were adjusted in the far UVC, perhaps overly adjusted and that because it had pressure uh, related to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. The, the other points that I wanna make is that the, uh, the limits as exposure limits are also listed in the um, IES photobiology lamp safety standards that have been around for at least a quarter of a century. The, there's another group on the scene, which is known as the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. Now, this spun off of the International Radiation Protection Association, which is an international group uh, related to ionizing radiation protection, X-rays, gamma rays, nuclear power, and all that sort of thing. So the people in ICNRP are normally related to ionizing radiation health and safety. And their focus actually in recent decades has been largely with radio frequency radiation and cell phones and things like that. They're well known in that field, but we also have optical radiation limits. And uh, I was involved in, in writing the, both the ACGH and the ICNRP limits, which is why up until a year ago, they've had pretty much the same values. Uh, ICNRP no longer has many experts in optical radiation on the main commission, but they do have people like my, me and others who are familiar with optical radiation under what's called uh, special uh, expert groups. Uh, there is one thing that's different between Europe and the US, and that is there is an occupational uh, guideline, no, occupational regulation known as the European Union Optical Radiation Directive, which uses the ICNRP, formerly ACGH, uh, exposure limits. Uh, I might just say that ICNRP adopted their uh, limits uh, about uh, 20 years ago, and they basically 
agreed that the ACGH limits were adequately conservative for the general population. Now that's an important distinction because ACGH is focused on occupational exposure, which as uh, this previous speaker just said, are for healthy adults, w working adults. So we're normally not talking about people who are immunocompromised or have special uh, photosensitivities and so forth. And occupational exposure limits have the uh, assumption that experts in occupational health and medicine are applying them. And there's a caveat in the beginning of the ACGH uh, booklet that says to be, these are not fine lines between safe and hazardous, and they're to be administered by people expert in the practice of industrial hygiene. And they might be under a medical surveillance program. So that's a very different situation than the general population, which ICNRP tries to address. Nevertheless, they've had pretty much the same limits, and they're currently reviewing their current limits to be sure that we're adequately addressing the whole population. So what are the key points when we're setting any kind of occupational or environmental health exposure guideline? Well, first of all, we have to identify what are the adverse effects. And sometimes there are big uh, uh, gaps. Sometimes there's a consensus. Sometimes the uh, medical establishment's very familiar with it and so forth. And uh, what are the endpoints if for uh, a threshold effect? Notice that the, the occupational exp exposure limits are uh, termed threshold limit effects. It's a threshold above which you start having concern, but not necessarily a fine line between safe and hazardous because there's individual variability and population variability. And we have to ask that question, how, uh, how does the potential risk of exposure varies with, with different population and different age groups and so forth? And a key point in my mind is that all of our biomedical data are basically in agreement. There's not conflicting data. For example, there's not molecular biology that says, oh, this is terrible, but all the human epidemiological data says is we don't we can't detect it. Why? You know, we need to understand mechanisms. So in establishing these limits, these committees normally have very lengthy deliberations on uh, what is, do we have general uh, understanding of all the interaction mechanisms? And can we be quantitative or, or we just say avoid needless exposure type of guidance? So the second step is that you need to balance benefits versus risk because there are, are actual benefits of UV exposure, vitamin D synthesis, immune uh, modulation and so forth that are seen as uh, benefits. And for example, in Australia, they've had a major battle between the, uh, uh, the, the bone specialists who wanted to see more UV because they were seeing some deficits of, U, of vitamin D versus the uh, skin cancer prevention people. So they had quite a to-do about uh, two decades ago, and they're finally talking to each other and trying to have a consensus approach. The third step is uh, distinguishing between special risk populations. For example, for radiofrequency radiation, both the IEEE and ICNRP and the different groups that have recommended limits and uh, for cell phones and so forth have two steps, one for the general population and one for more or less occupational. They don't use the term occupational, they say special group or something like that. Uh, but we have not had that so far for UV, but I'm gonna try to point out that there may be some justification for it. Finally, if you make too complicated a, a, a limit that people can't easily measure and can't easily assess, uh, and only a few experts know how to do, that's not a very effective uh, limit. So key points. There have been comments here about call it UVD and this and that. For 
85 years we've had the same CIE definitions in photobiology for UVA, UVB, and UVC. Don't mess with it. It's based upon real differences in photobiological reactions in different bands. And it was recognized a century ago. And those are based, for example, where do you have strong protein absorption? Where do you have strong water absorption? Things like this. And they do influence the photobiological effects. This is a broad umbrella under which we can work, but they're only fine, they're only uh, shorthand notations. They're not fine lines where you get one effect and you don't have another effect. But you can see why when you talk about different types of uh, acute and chronic effects, that it's fairly useful as a first uh, notation uh, to say where you're going to have some uh, effects. And I would say that throughout the UVC, we have very similar effects. This group wants to make a big distinction between two sub parts of that spectrum, but both are vastly safer than, say, UVB by comparison. The other thing is we need to keep in mind in photobiology that one photon interacts with one molecule. Now, there may be a cascade of other biochemical uh, effects after the initial photochemical uh, interaction, but that's the initial stimulus. It's the photon interacting with molecule. And the consensus has been for a long time that for long-term delayed effects, you have to worry about uh, damage to DNA. So keep that in mind. And, and also, as uh, Paul mentioned, we have to take into consideration that the uh, uh, the real limits are based upon total exposure during the day. And it may be broken up, it may be for a few hours only, whatever. And so the, that's the real limit. And that gives a real problem to the people like UL who want to figure out a, a worst case exposure. Other people that have, I don't have time to get into this, but please learn the differences between fluence and radiant exposure. Uh, there are real differences and they have special meanings. Uh, so we know a lot about the acute effects. What about the delayed effects? Though that's very, very difficult to tease out by epidemiological studies and medical studies. But a key thing from animal research studies and knowledge of mechanism is the international standardized non-melanoma skin cancer action spectrum. Notice that that is limited almost totally to UVB. And as soon as you get into the UVC or the UVA, it goes to a very, very small risk. I raised the question, do we have special risk groups? And we do in the sense that it's well recognized in photodermatology, the distinction between uh, young children, uh, normal adults, and then finally elderly because the location of the target tissue for long-term risk is at the basal layer of, of the uh, epithelium. And the, th the thing there to remember is that this is very undulating in a small child, and this is the risk group of three to five, three to six years old has been identified in epidemiology as a very high risk for a much long-term delayed uh, etiology of uh, uh, melanoma. And that's been seen very nicely from some Australia epidemiological studies. So that's a key point. One minute. Yes. So there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of material to get through really quickly. There are some uh, photobiological effects, long-term delayed effects on the eye that can pretty well be stated we're not going to see with UVC. And you can see our poster up in uh, uh, P9. If you haven't seen it, you can uh, get a little more insight into that. But the key thing is that wavelengths in the UVB can barely reach the lens. So you're not going to have any UVC reaching below the basal layers of the uh, cornea. The other thing is, Action spectra are very important because our exposure limits are 
basically a, uh, an effective type of action spectrum and an envelope action spectrum or weighting factor. And I just want to emphasize that uh, 50 years ago, we were told by NIST that we should always plot action spectra and emission measurements in terms of this type of histogram, which shows the bandwidth over which that data point uh, exists. And one thing that really annoys me is people publishing data with a single wavelength I, that's identified as the peak wavelength. Depending upon how narrow that is, you can get very inaccurate levels. And the irony is that to my knowledge, the best action spectrum for erythema, acute effects, skin reddening, it was published a century ago by some German physicists and it, it shows the importance of endpoint as to picking the action spectrum at different times during, uh, during a week or two. And it's noted that the uh, UVC uh, components are very transitory compared to the UVB components, which makes sense when you think about all of this. The other thing is I wanna just point out, this is a revised uh, uh, ACGH limits, which are much steeper. The original or ICNRP limits go like this. And this was based a lot on sort of basic studies. And we've, since, since this curve was published, it seems pretty evident that the real uh, absorption spectrum comes down a lot steeper to 240. And if you go to the basic literature, you'll find that there's very little uh, um, true measured data uh, at those shorter wavelengths. So I'll just finish by saying that the, uh, the ICNRP limit or, or the HGH limit is a summation of your spectrum of your source weighted by this weighting function and it's expressed as a total dose or total rating exposure. So as several people have mentioned, the time weighted average, which is well understood by industrial hygienists, is used uh, uh, for that. And uh, I'll simply say that the IES uh, RP44 has uh, suggested using some of these occupational exposure guidelines, but it was, prom it was promoted during the time of the uh, pandemic. I'll, I'll uh, finish there and take any questions. Thank you, just in the interest of time, we'll move on, David, and if people okay. can grab you. Uh, okay, very good. Any questions? Uh, as I walk